this is a meeting we're going to, uh, this is a meeting we're going to record and also share uh, 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 via YouTube and also other social media. Uh, and uh, this is a new uh, trends for our uh, group uh, because we used to be very much uh, 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 closed door, Chenham House and brainstorming. But uh, now we think that uh, at least for some discussions we can open to the public, not necessarily our discussion here, but uh, what we discuss here will be shared, of course, afterwards uh, via uh, YouTube and others. So today we are going to have a, a, a brainstorming uh, on the new paper by uh, a New Pathway uh, by our friend Stephen and Kamel. Uh, and uh, thanks to Annabelle who has brought uh, to our attention this, uh, this paper. Uh, and uh, which is very good. I know we think it's very important uh, that we, we immediately host this and engage ambassadors for this uh, subject because uh, for quite some time we have been trying to do so, but uh, without uh, in the entry point. Uh, and uh, that's why also uh, uh, we also invite not only Clemens, uh, uh, the former director for agriculture as moderator, but also my friend, Alan Matthews, uh, to be the moderator. Uh, one reason is not only, of course, he's an uh, 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 agricultural expert, but also he and I, we have just finished the paper also on agriculture negotiations, uh, so which hopefully will be made public uh, uh, very soon, uh, in a few days time. So, so we thanks a lot for your attention uh, and we look for the dynamic uh, discussion and hopefully uh, through our joint efforts, we'll find new pathway for this important negotiation. So thanks a lot. Over to you, Clemens. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lou. Thank you very much indeed. Alejandro, I can see that you're all wrapped up. Are you cold? It's uh, Clemens. Yeah, it's pretty cold over here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. For, thank you all for joining us, and in particular to Carmel and her co-conspirators. I'm not quite sure who's the author of this paper, Carmel. There seem to be a lot of names associated with it, but I will make you the chief. <laughs> well, and welcome to, to Ag, the problem child of the WTO. And, and yet not quite. You know, in, I, I remember when I was there in December, of November, late, uh, late 2009, we came very close to an agreement. And ironically, what, one of the things that prevented it was that NAMA was not ready and everything had to be decided before anything was decided. So it didn't go ahead, but it came close and it did so on the basis of this wonderful Rev4 text, you know, the elegant, simple text, Rev4. But now that the bonds of the go around in a sense are loosened, <clears throat> perhaps our, uh, agriculture can drive to an agreement on its own. And certainly the paper presented by Carmel and her, and her <coughs> co-authors shows us how this might be possible, how it might be done. The question that keeps on bugging me is whether politically we are actually ready for such an agreement. And at the moment, I have real doubts. I mean, MC12 looks dismal. It looks as if at the moment they're talking about a minimalist decision simply to continue the negotiations. I'd, I'd hope for more. I'd hope that at least we could have something on, on notifications and certainly on export restrictions. And you remember what we did with the French presidency, Carmel, we, we, got, we got a decent decision there. Yeah. And it just has never been taken up in the WTO and this is on humanitarian food shipments. It's time we did that. So as, as we go through, your, as you go through your paper, Carmel and, and uh, Stefan and Alan, perhaps you might also, just wonder a little bit about whether you think we're ready to do it politically, whether we're ready to take such a decision uh, to move the whole process forward. With that, Karma, thank you very much for the paper you've presented. It's full of very nice ideas. And I'm going to give the floor over to you to take us through them. Thank you, Karma. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Clem. I'm going to attempt screen sharing here and hope that that works. Okay, does that work? 
I can see it, yes. Okay, if you can see it, I guess everybody can, and you can also hear me. Yes? Okay, oh, everybody's muted, I see. No, okay. I, can see, I can see it and I can see you. Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Clem. Um, uh, Stefan and I are going to share uh, the presentation uh, today. And uh, we also have um, Alan Matthews, uh, who will talk to the paper, I believe. And I saw on the list also um, uh, Guillermo. Uh, I'm not sure if he's actually there, but I saw him on the list. I hope he is. He was also uh, one of our one of our number. Um, it's uh, it's quite a privilege to be able to uh, talk to 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 this group. And I understand we also have some um, WTO ambassadors and and some members of the WTO secretariat. Uh, so I'm sure we're going to have a very, um, a very good and perhaps uh, challenging uh, discussion. Uh, Clem, you, you put out a question immediately about the, um, the political environment. I, I guess we'll talk about that a, a lot. Um, but from the outset, I guess, uh, within the group, our, our idea was to somehow put the political considerations aside and we wrote a paper uh, that presents the views of a bunch of, of academics, ex-negotiators, ex-officials in international organizations, etc., where the first sentence on every page was, what if the political will existed, what could be done? Now, that may be too much of a, too much of a dodge. And certainly, we, we're happy to discuss um, you know, what, what might be necessary to put in place in order to generate some of that political will. But it's a very, very big question, I think, that goes um, way, way beyond uh, beyond agriculture. But I'm, I'm sure we'll we'll get back to it. Um, this is the, the list of the people who were involved in, in, in our group. So as you see, it was uh, Stefan and myself who coordinated. And then there's another list, a fairly long list of people I've imagine all of them are, are, are known to you. And we had a very good time. We never saw each other, um, uh, but we had a very good time uh, putting the paper together and finding the, the common ground. Um, it wasn't always terribly easy, although our, we had a lot of things in common to begin with, obviously. Uh, so the paper does say that uh, not everybody is, is in agreement with every single detail of the proposal, but I think we're all probably good with 90 or 95%. Of, uh, that's my interpretation a little bit of, of, of where we are. In any case, it was, um, it was a lot of fun uh, working with this, uh, with this group of, of people. So between us, uh, we've all been heavily involved in, in, in agriculture. I think there are... Uh, several hundreds of years of experience in thinking about agriculture issues, whether domestic policy or international trade or how the two uh, interact. Um, I think we all shared this deep commitment as indeed uh, we share with this group here today, this deep commitment to um, the idea that multilateralism can do an awful lot of good, um, but that it's not just about multilateralism for trade, but that multilateralism can drive more efficient and more effective, less wasteful and less inconsistent policies at home. And of course, more and more, when we think about that, we have uh, really do have to take into consideration that any progress that is going to be made can only be made if it can demonstrably be shown also um, uh, to be capable of, sus of delivering on sustainable development and being um, positive for, for climate and, and resource issues and, and uh, all the rest of it. Um, it. It's probably obvious to this group, but we think it's important to say when we um, present our ideas that we, uh, we are, some of us have affiliations, some have no affiliation, affiliation whatsoever, but we all worked independently. And we, um, we were very uh, specific that we did not want to accept any support from any government, from any institution um, in carrying out this work. So uh, it was done on not even a low budget, but no budget, um, including our website, which was created um, for me by my son, who is not, um, it's not his profession, but he's better at these things than, than, than I am. 
So um, I think lots of you are very familiar with the whole history and background of this, but some of you maybe are not agriculture specialized specialists. So I'll, I'll just maybe very quickly uh, say a few words about you know how we got how we got here. Uh, so uh, some of us were actually involved way back then in, in either um, uh, openly or, or a little bit behind the scenes in the negotiations on, on the Uruguay round. But when the, the agreement on agriculture was made, it was, it was truly innovative. It was innovative because it brought agriculture in uh, for the first time. It was innovative in the sense of the three pillar structure um, and in particular, because it explicitly attempted to uh, discipline distorting uh, domestic support. And it was innovative because um, the way in which uh, domestic support was sought to be disciplined was by quantifying um, the, the, the value, as it were, of those uh, distorting interventions and um, proceeding to attempt to reduce them and not uh, by attempting to prove that they did particular harm to a particular country's trade flows in the way that the, the subsidies agreement does. Um, and that is maybe a subject, although I'm not an expert on it, but I think it's a subject we might want to come back to. You know, how, how important was this as an innovation and are there lessons uh, to be learned for how things might be done today, uh, given the, the, the difficulties that are, are facing um, the WTO and particularly given the difficulties about um, how to discipline uh, the range of subsidies that are currently uh, out there. So it was of course recognized in the, the 94 agreement that it was only a beginning and the agreement itself talked about relaunching the negotiations in 2000, in 2000 which duly happened and then uh, in 2001 were incorporated into the DD, DDA. As Clem said, um, there was almost an agreement in, in 2008, although um, I'm, I'm not sure that I uh, have the same view of what that agreement might have achieved because it was extremely complex and very difficult to work out actually what it might have done um, uh, with an awful lot of exceptions and exemptions and special derogations and all of that. It was a bit, a bit difficult to know what it would have achieved. In any case, it was not, it was not agreed. And as you've, you've said, uh, uh, Clem, there are what are described as intensive negotiations going on now, but the level of ambition is actually, it would seem uh, very low. So uh, there may be a result on transparency, uh, but transparency is just getting countries to do things they committed to do anyway a very long time ago. Um, I don't think there's uh, any real uh, possibility of the proposals that are out there to somehow stop the growth in domestic support entitlements or to eliminate some of the waters seem unlikely to, 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 um, to, to, to succeed. Uh, there is the possibility of setting a work program going forward and I guess we would position ourselves um, in that context and with maybe uh, you know, uh, what's that expression about hope um, winning out over, over uh, pragmatism or reality? I can't quite remember the expression, but maybe with the hope that some kind of a useful work program could be set and part of that work program could actually be uh, to put in place and have some exchanges on the basis of a, an up-to-date evidence base because discussions at the moment take place on, on the basis of, of data and disciplines that um, don't really make a whole lot of sense because they date back to um, that original Uruguay round agreement, including those um, out of date reference prices, which make it very, very difficult to interpret the indicators that, that result. So um, that's maybe not a very big ambition, but uh, even, even a, a, an outcome that said, let's have a look at the data, the actual real data um, might, might actually um, help to, to uh, take things forward. That would be, um, I'm going to say a little bit about what was some of the general threads running through what we, um, what we did. And uh, I'll talk about market access and then Stefan will talk over and talk, take over and talk about the rest of the, the proposals. So uh, the first thing that we think absolutely has to be done um, for the negotiations to, to make any sense is that uh, they have to start from an evidence base that actually reflects where countries are now. Um, and that does mean, um, 
you know, there's an awful lot of information out there, uh, either from uh, the OECD, from something called the MathUp initiative uh, that is housed at the FAO. I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with that. Um, IFPRI is also uh, hosting an effort among all those institutions to put all that data together. Um, it's not such a difficult thing to do. Um, the, the information is there, but it, it, seemed, it seemed to us that the world had changed so dramatically since um, the Uruguay round was agreed that uh, you have to somehow reset uh, all of the buttons and start the negotiations from a picture of, of, of where the world is today. Another thread that was very, uh, was common to, is common to everything that we propose is that you, uh, you need to get um, balance among countries. So uh, the Uruguay round required all developed countries to reduce this and that by X percent and all developing countries to reduce by a smaller percent. We're saying, whether we're talking about market access or, or, or domestic support, that the efforts that should be required should be commensurate with the starting point. Um, we're also saying that no country that's actually important in global terms, in, in terms of how much it produces or consumes or trades in agriculture should be somehow left out of the, the, the game. So they should, they should all um, contribute to the process commensurate to what their initial policy positions are and commensurate with their importance in, in, in the world. Um, we have all seen the, the, the sense of grievance that has um, uh, grown up over the years uh, as, again, countries evolved, the geopolitical balance has changed and the agreement on agriculture was not updated. So it's absolutely essential that these grievances I mean, some of them are real, some of them are perceived, but they need to be seen to be, to be addressed. It's also important to simplify and to, to close uh, loopholes. And when Stefan talks through the agreement, um, you'll get a better sense of what we mean by that. But for example, in, in, in the context of, of addressing grievances um, on domestic support, uh, while we uh, propose that the uh, Article 6.2 um, exemption of, of input subsidies be eliminated. We also propose uh, that um, the blue box be eliminated, that decoupled income support payments in Annex 2 be, be disciplined, um, that the, the distinction between you know, the AMS and the de minimis be removed and that everybody be put on the same footing. So there's a lot there that addresses those grievances that have, um, have, uh, have grown up while at the same time closing uh, loopholes. We think the approach has got to be holistic. We've seen that when a piecemeal approach was taken, that countries somehow got what they wanted and had no reason to come to the table anymore. I'm saying that um, fairly bluntly uh, to, to, to this company. But uh, just in economic terms as well, it's important that the approach be holistic because the, the market access, domestic support and export competition pillars are somehow like an inter interconnected system of, 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 of valves and you need to somehow move on all of them uh, in order to really have the, the, the best effect. It's all interconnected. So we advocate very strongly for a, a balanced and a holistic approach. We, we believe that there is huge scope, even more than there was 30 years ago for what we call win-win solutions. Uh, the work that, that's, that's been done over the years by OECD, the work that's done in academia, done by other institutions, um, it's, it, there's a very big consensus around the fact that the most market and trade distorting and disrupting measures are also the measures um, in large degree that are very negative for the environment and for, for climate change. Um, and so it's, it, it, at some level, it's unthinkable that a multilateral agreement uh, should actually incentivize the use of measures that are negative in virtually every dimension that that matters <laughs> for the world at the moment. So, and, but we think there's huge scope. There's huge scope to uh, roll back on the measures that are are negative in all those dimensions, but also to nudge towards measures uh, as is done already with the green box, but it can go further to nudge towards measures that would be positive for. Um, in the social dimension, in the environmental dimension, in, in climate change. Um, and then finally, uh, while we, uh, many of us have an interest in many of these issues, we're all uh, agriculture experts. 
And while we might have views and we, we know it's really important um, that uh, there be progress on issues like special and differential treatment, on how subsidies are, 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 are disciplined, on issues around dispute settlement, all of those things. And um, we, we put them aside a little bit and say, um, yes, they're very important. They have huge impacts for agriculture, but we don't ourselves make uh, proposals. We were also careful to delineate a little bit our scope. So we have a little bit of a discussion about um, whether it's appropriate to think of actual trade policy measures in pursuit of better nutrition or climate change or whatever. And we thought, uh, you know, given the, the difficulty there is, uh, in getting any agreement on issues that are already on the table, um, that going any further in that direction was probably not particularly useful at this point. And again, maybe the matter for people with expertise um, beyond uh, what, what, what we have got. So th those are the commonalities really that, that, that motivated us. So let me just say a quick word about market access and then I will hand over to, to Stefan. You can get the detail, I won't go into all of the detail, you'll find the detail in, in, in the paper. But here, as I said, when it comes to tariff reduction, we propose that it always be um, commensurate with the starting point. So whether you use a tiered system or whether you use the Swiss formula, um, the idea would be that the highest tariffs would be reduced proportionately more than, than lower tariffs. Um, we propose the elimination of the SSG that's been only what almost 30 years now that it's been in place. I think it was envisaged as a transition measure and the transition is, is well and truly over. That was the possibility that countries who tariff quite had uh, to invoke that um, SSG. We propose a fairly limited um, a special safeguard measure. I know there's been an awful lot of discussion about that. Um, uh, but we do propose a fairly limited measure because, uh, you know, as a bunch of mainly economists, we, we didn't want to put our names to a measure that could actually result in higher levels of protection than had existed before. So uh, we say price based only. Uh, and then in different options, we, uh, we suggest that it should be um, uh, perhaps time limited, time limited in the uh, extent time limited in the sense that any tariff resulting from the SSM could only be applied for a limited period, but also time limited in the sense that the measure itself would not be perpetual, that it would finish after some period like, like, um, like five years. So those are the, the, the options um, that we have on market access. And I'll, I'll hand over to Stefan with a, a remark that I should have made earlier. And it kind of goes to the question that Clem raised about the, the political will. We know that every single aspect of every single part of the proposal that we have made has already been rejected by one or more or many countries. But we we believe that you know the package allows for some of those arbitrations and, and trade-offs to make it um, to make it more palatable. Um, I say that because I know the SSM has been extremely uh, difficult. Uh, uh, discussion in, in, in Geneva. Well, with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Stefan, if I may. That come why don't you keep the PowerPoint open and move it forward so we... Okay, great, have a break. that works, okay. Uh, next slide, please. And let me just begin by echoing Karma's introductory comment, uh, saying how much we appreciate having the privilege of talking to this group uh, and learning from your experience. Uh, and. Uh, your comments uh, that we look forward uh, to uh, your comments on our proposals. Now let's uh, come to that uh, all important uh, matter of domestic support, which we understand uh, is uh, generally at this time considered to be the most uh, difficult, the most intractable uh, part of the uh, ongoing debates. Uh, I, very much in the spirit that uh, Carmel mentioned already regarding the uh, absolute value of having uh, current information on where countries stand. Uh, we are strongly for updated notifications, notifications of the sort that uh, are generally required anyhow under the AOA, uh, but then also uh, notifications that are 
uh, replicated uh, for the most uh, recent years uh, with the uh, agreed parameters uh, that uh, might come out of uh, the whole package uh, of newly uh, agreed rules uh, that would uh, somehow uh, resemble uh, the verification process uh, that everybody had uh, in the Uruguay run. Having said that, uh, let's come to uh, the various options uh, that we have proposed uh, on domestic support. Uh, by the way, uh, why do we have uh, alternative options? Simply uh, because we wouldn't claim we have infinite wisdom. Negotiators uh, may want uh, a choice of alternative options, uh, and therefore we come up uh, with that uh, possibility. In the area of domestic support, all of the graduated options about which I'll speak in a moment uh, have uh, in common uh, that uh, both the blue box uh, that at the time uh, really targeted uh, developed countries uh, as an exemption uh, and the input subsidy exemption for developing countries of Article 6.2 uh, are removed. Uh, why uh, should they be removed? Because both of them uh, are uh, pretty distortionary. Uh, the blue box at the time was considered uh, <laughs> to consist of measures uh, that because of production constraints didn't distort. When you look at uh, the nature of measures uh, under uh, that particular uh, element, uh, you find uh, they are indeed uh, pretty distorting measures. Uh, and input subsidies, uh, as has been shown by a lot of economic analysis, uh, are uh, probably the most uh, distorting uh, type of policy, simply because uh, it puts uh, everybody can uh, buy at uh, whatever quantities uh, they consider uh, sensible, while land uh, is uh, generally a, a given resource and cannot be expended. Uh, that simply explains why input subsidies tend to be very distorting. So uh, do away with both these uh, elements of domestic support in all of the options that we proposed. All of the benchmarks then, uh, benchmarks for the values of domestic support that would still be allowed uh, under uh, the new commitments uh, we propose should be defined relative to the value of production as a share of value of production, simply because it appears to us to make uh, most economic uh, sense. Everybody is in all sorts of uh, parts of life uh, thinking in terms of uh, percentages of uh, relativities uh, and the same thing uh, is uh, probably also making a lot of sense in economic terms. Like uh, for uh, tariffs, uh, the suggestion quite naturally is the countries with the highest support levels should reduce uh, most uh, and uh, everybody should in the end aim uh, at uh, not exceeding an agreed benchmark, which in a way would be akin to uh, the uh, current uh, the thing where, where you can have a, a certain percentage of uh, support, uh, de minimis, uh, something like that uh, would be the new benchmark at an agreed uh, percentage. Uh, we strongly argue for uh, having provisions uh, that uh, would make sure not too much of support is concentrated on individual uh, products. Uh, one can think of uh, alternative uh, options uh, for that. Uh, for example, no product should have more than a given share uh, of total support uh, or uh, the uh, individual products with the highest support should be reduced most. Uh, but it's important uh, to not allow countries uh, to concentrate uh, the allowed total amount of support on a small number of individual commodities. Uh, it, is also a, a common uh, element uh, that uh, where uh, market price support is uh, calculated uh, on the basis of external reference prices. Uh, no uh, market price support will be calculated uh, where the administered price is 
below the external reference price, simply because in economic terms, there's no support if uh, the domestic uh, support price is not above uh, the board price level. Uh, we have a number of uh, suggestions uh, as to how economic loopholes uh, should be uh, closed. Just to give you one example, uh, when it comes to um, the uh, amount of uh, domestic production uh, for which uh, market price support is uh, calculated, it should be all production, not just uh, the procured amount or the amount uh, that the administration has uh, defined as uh, eligible for support. Uh, come on, can you move forward uh, the slide again? No, I don't know what happened there. It did that all by itself. Uh, did it by itself. Then, then, then let me try and go to my... Ah, oh, I, I can't do that as long as your screen is... Okay, so I'll, I'll pause sharing. Yes, please do. It's Maybe not I'll yet closed. It's not yet closed. Okay, I'll stop sharing altogether. Yep, yeah, good. That means I can open mine and can. Okay. Great. Now let's come to the uh, three alternative options that we have proposed uh, and they all uh, have to do or the differences between have to do with the way market price support is calculated. The first option uh, would calculate uh, market price support uh, like it was uh, done or still is being done under the agreement on agriculture. Uh, except that, of course, we suggest uh, it should no longer be uh, these historical external reference prices uh, of 1986, uh, 88, which are totally outdated and uh, don't really serve uh, any good economic purpose in terms of measuring the actual level of support. Uh, we suggest uh, it should be a, a moving average or an, an Olympic uh, average uh, of most uh, recent three or five years. Uh, but otherwise, uh, and, uh, our option one, uh, fundamentally, uh, the approach to measuring market price support under the AOA will be maintained. We are, though, uh, very... Uh, clear uh, in saying this is a pretty complex way of uh, dealing with matters uh, and has caused all sorts of uh, problems. And therefore, uh, we also uh, propose two alternative options, both of which would much simplify uh, the way uh, the countries have to deal uh, with market price support. Uh, option two is uh, one where uh, market price support would uh, simply be calculated uh, by uh, looking at uh, the expenditure uh, that domestic agencies or private agents uh, acting on behalf of them uh, spent on procuring uh, product uh, so as to support prices. Uh, simply the administered price is multiplied uh, by the quantity purchased. Uh, the economic value of that particular way of measuring it is, uh, we agree, somewhat questionable, but at least uh, this is a very much simplified uh, approach. And uh, in addition to that, you would also, uh, of course, have all other budgetary support. Uh, because of the uh, different economic uh, nature of these two elements, you could not add them up. Each of them uh, separately would have to undergo reduction according to the agreed uh, schedule. Now, the, the real nirvana, if you like, uh, regarding domestic support, uh, what we reached under our option three, 
where we have just a constraint on uh, the actual budgetary expenditure including of course expenditure uh, on any domestic uh, uh, buying uh, to support prices uh, you have this one measure we uh, argue for that the only uh, under the condition uh, that uh, market access uh, has really made a lot of progress in terms of reducing tariffs. The economic logic behind that is you cannot really provide price support domestically uh, if you don't have uh, effective protection at the border. And therefore, if border protection is sufficiently reduced, uh, then indeed uh, you could go to that nirvana of measuring uh, only uh, budgetary uh, expenditure and limiting uh, that. So far for the general domestic uh, support, let's move on uh, to uh, the famous or if you like infamous uh, green box. Uh, which would be indeed maintained uh, under all of our proposals, uh, but uh, we have uh, two different options to offer uh, for that particular uh, element. Uh, the first one would essentially, again, uh, maintain the uh, current framework uh, under the AOA. Uh, we have suggestions for uh, clarifying a number of provisions, uh, for easing some, tightening uh, others, I don't want to go into any details on that because quite frankly, uh, I believe most of the group uh, that has worked out these proposals uh, would have a preference for option two uh, in which uh, the totality of everything that's currently covered in the green box uh, would be categorized into three different types. Uh, one would be all uh, the direct payments uh, that are uh, currently under the uh, green box of the AOA uh, with a number of uh, amendments uh, like under option one. Uh, that would uh, continue uh, to have to be notified. Uh, category B uh, would be a number of policies uh, that uh, are beneficial in terms of uh, their social, uh, their environmental, their public good characteristics. Uh, and we suggest uh, there's not even a need to notify them uh, on a regular basis, uh, only when they're introduced or fundamentally changed uh, notification is necessary. But uh, essentially these are, if you like, uh, good policies uh, that countries uh, should not be discouraged from uh, actually pursuing. Uh, but the real trick uh, under our option two is uh, category C, existing uh, solely of decoupled income support, uh, which we suggest should indeed be kept and reduced. Uh, on that is, uh, I believe, uh, a very fundamental change uh, to current conditions. Uh, more specifically, uh, of course, we say, look, these measures uh, can play an important role uh, as a, a concomitant of uh, reforming domestic policies. Uh, the typical example of that is uh, what the European Union uh, did uh, when they moved away from uh, price support uh, and introduced uh, these so-called decoupled direct payments. Uh, that's fine if a country goes there, but it should then also uh, see that uh, they are not needed on a long-term basis, should be transitory. Now, what happens if a country again wants to introduce uh, such measures uh, as part of a reform of domestic policies? Clearly, let them have that, uh, but again, uh, not at a level uh, higher than uh, what they've taken away from more distorting support. Uh, kept at that level and to be reduced uh, in future. So far for domestic uh, support, what about uh, the difficult uh, matter of public stock holding uh, that for a number of years now uh, plagues uh, the negotiations? Uh, we suggest uh, that uh, if market price uh, support is measured uh, the way uh, that we have suggested in particular 
uh, where the administered price is not above the external reference price and uh, note the updated uh, most recent external reference price level. Uh, if that uh, is not considered market price support, uh, that would probably do away uh, with the most difficult part of that particular element. Uh, and uh, it's a very logical uh, step uh, to be taken. Uh, we also suggest uh, that as a matter of clarification, domestic food aid uh, targeted to the poor should not be subject to discipline uh, and food aid in the form of cash or vouchers. Uh, we wouldn't actually consider uh, a matter of agricultural policy. It's a matter of social policy uh, and therefore uh, the agreement on agriculture, the new one should not aim at uh, imposing any limits on that. Is there anything on the export side that needs to be done? Uh, the Nairobi decision, uh, as mentioned earlier, has indeed uh, been a major and very important step uh, forward. Uh, it's our impression uh, it's not uh, monitored sufficiently uh, well. Uh, that could be improved. Uh, we also suggest uh, that there should be a few additional commitments uh, regarding food aid and uh, in particular also export credit uh, that state trading enterprises need enhanced monitoring uh, to be brought under better uh, control, uh, but that's largely it as far as export competition is concerned. On export restrictions, uh, we uh, propose, like uh, has been done by uh, many other quarters already, uh, that purchases for humanitarian purposes, uh, like the food program, should be uh, definitely exempt uh, from export restrictions. We also though, go as far as suggesting uh, that uh, where export restrictions uh, are in place, uh, they should uh, be converted into export tariffs through a process uh, much similar to the tarification uh, process for import barriers uh, that took place uh, under the Uruguay round uh, and that these export tariffs should then be bound and uh, reduced. Cotton, we suggest cotton uh, should uh, go first, if you like, in terms of uh, reducing both cotton tariffs uh, and uh, domestic support for cotton, uh, which uh, irrespective of the actual level of uh, support and tariffs uh, that are being provided uh, in the cotton uh, sector, uh, these things should be reduced at the highest uh, rates uh, for the highest tier of uh, tariffs uh, and domestic uh, support generally uh, agreed <laughs> in the round. Uh, so just to make sure uh, that uh, it's clear, there's a particular ambition uh, in the sector of uh, cotton. That has taken us uh, through our uh, detailed proposals on the individual parts of the uh, big package of matters uh, that are on the a negotiating table of those having to deal with agriculture. We uh, suggest uh, strongly uh, that uh, one should look at this uh, as uh, individual elements of uh, one holistic uh, package. Uh, and uh, that indeed is a uh, potential, uh, if not actual problem in the negotiations uh, where one talks about individual elements of that package uh, and uh, is uh, in danger of uh, losing uh, the vision <coughs> of the forest for the individual trees. We claim uh, that the uh, package uh, that we've come up with is balanced. Uh, it uh, allows grievances uh, to be addressed. Everybody uh, has to concede uh, on some of their uh, long held positions. Uh, there are trade-offs, uh, Carmen has already mentioned, uh, I've explained it <laughs> again, uh, negotiate if you like uh, the blue box away and uh, limits on uh, green box uh, 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 support uh, for uh, income and decoupled way uh, in exchange for also doing away with the Arctic 6.2 <laughs> exemption for uh, input subsidies. Uh, 
again, as Carmel uh, said, uh, why not take a first step uh, by agreeing on a uh, work program uh, that was established the evidence based uh, because uh, the world has moved on a lot uh, since uh, the Uruguay Round Agreement on Agriculture was uh, struck at the time. Uh, we have a wholly different uh, landscape of uh, support levels uh, across countries now. Uh, so uh, starting from a, a new evidence base would uh, do a lot, I believe, in explaining to everybody how important it is uh, to uh, make a big step forward. Uh, Clem, uh, to your question, uh, is, is all this politically feasible? Uh, of course, uh, certainly academic uh, academics my, uh, like myself uh, are probably not the best uh, to uh, say that, but uh, let me make uh, one uh, hopefully uh, relatively strong point uh, by way of uh, conclusion. The world has so important uh, issues to deal with in uh, this time, uh, in particular regarding climate change. We need so uh, absolutely innovative, uh, complex uh, measures, uh, including at the level of the WTO to deal with these uh, huge and complex problems. If the world uh, has uh, no way to handle the old fashioned matters of tariffs and uh, subsidies in agriculture, how then could we ever hope uh, to come to grips uh, with the much, much uh, more complex and uh, difficult matters of tomorrow? So let's uh, get this business done uh, to open the doors uh, for dealing uh, with uh, even more, much more complex uh, matters in the future. Now, uh, you have been told uh, this is a uh, paper that you can, uh, if uh, you're interested in, uh, uh, look up at that website, uh, where you also, by the way, find a uh, four-page summary of it. Uh, and uh, we certainly look forward to your comments uh, now in the session. Um, but uh, if you want to write it to us, uh, can uh, do so. Uh, by going uh, to that email address uh, below there. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Thank you. I uh, Clem, you're muted. Clem, you're muted. Good. Clem, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah. And now? It's good now. I'm okay, you can hear me. Yeah. Tremendous. Thank you both very much for that presentation. Stefan, could you take your screen sharing off, please? Yes, I'm trying that at this moment. And <laughs> I difficult. somehow, I'm in a similar, ah, I believe. Okay. Taking your screen sharing off may be as difficult as getting 6 2 to be, able to be dropped from the agreement. <laughs> Country, the developing countries are very, very attached to that. But thank you both very much for, for what you've done. Carmel, I, I don't want, Carmel, I don't want you to leave with the impression that I thought an agreement in December 2009 would have been a good thing. It was based on an extremely complicated document. Yeah. It would have made monitoring even more difficult than things are at present, particularly as every country, virtually every member insisted on an exemption footnote of its own. It would have been impossible. And I'm not sure it would have served the purposes that we are faced with today. It, uh, what I like about your paper is that it, it simplifies a lot of this. It makes a lot of it easier to, to monitor. And what I liked in particular, before I turn to, to Alan, is the idea of, uh, of domestic supports being based simply on budgetary expenditure. What would it not be simple, would it not be nice if we could simply go to a common understanding of OTDS, members bind OTDS, base their expense and base their notification simply on expenditures that are in that particular context with perhaps some, some measures to prevent concentration as you've already mentioned. But that's simply a thought. Uh, 
I also, I, I repeat, I, I think getting rid of 6-2 is a very good idea, but I just don't think it's going to happen. Not, not, a, not in the short term. Uh, <laughs> really not in the short term. Having said all of that, and having taken more time perhaps than I should have, Alan, I can't see you, but are you there? Yes, indeed. Oh, there you are. Yes, you're in my top left-hand corner. Thanks, Alan. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, Alan, you're muted. You need to unmute, Alan. Sorry, I had. I yeah. thought I had done so, but uh, now I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be very short for two reasons. First of all, I think, uh, um, uh, as Carmel has uh, highlighted, I'm in a rather odd position for a discussant uh, of a presentation that I'm actually a, a contributor and a signatory of the document. So uh, expecting, if you like, some critical remarks might be, uh, might be too much. Uh, but what I would like to do is, is, is just to broaden the discussion because one can get lost in a, in a lot of the detail. And it seems to me uh, to, to really draw on the experience of the participants in, in this conversation uh, to maybe look at uh, three questions I'm just going to suggest. And one indeed, Clemens, is exactly the question you raised uh, because it, it is such an obvious one. Um, can we envisage a political moment uh, in the coming, uh, you know, near future, uh, which would correspond to that moment that led to the Blair House Agreement uh, and ultimately to the uh, Agreement on Agriculture in the Uruguay Round uh, so many uh, decades ago now. Um, I, I, I'll come back to that. I think the second question, which would be interesting to get reactions on, is that both Carmel and Stefan have been firm that they see this uh, package of proposals as a balanced package. Uh, the, the, the point was made that all countries would, would be expected to yield on some of their long held uh, positions, but that there would also be something in the package for all countries. And of course, that's an easy claim to make, uh, but you know, would the group actually consider that uh, the uh, proposals that they've heard actually add up to a balanced package? And Lemons, you've already, highlighted uh, you know one element the the article 6.2 where where you think that uh, you know being asked to give that up may just be a step too far for for some groups of countries but if we get past those two hurdles um, uh, the third question I think it would be interesting to uh, hear uh, the reflections of the group on is you know what might be the possible sequencing what might be the steps that you know, if we did see an opportunity for making progress, how to actually build uh, on that opportunity. So if I, if I could just make one or two points on, on each of those three uh, sort of broad themes, which I think uh, would be interesting to, to, to raise for discussion. Uh, on the first one, um, uh, I, I do make, uh, I did have a slide, but I'm not going to put it up just for the sake of time. Uh, but I find it interesting looking at the figures that the Canadian delegation have provided us with, where they've done a very nice spreadsheet summarizing all of the uh, data in the notifications uh, since uh, 1995. And if we just Take the two years, 2001, when China joined and, and notified support for the first time, um, and 2016, which uh, in that database is the last year where all the major uh, countries uh, have, have, have notified. So between 2001, 2016, uh, a 15-year period. And we're often critical of the uh, agreement on agriculture, but actually Article 6 support, so in other words, all trade distorting support, including that uh, element which is uh, exempted, it was 106 billion, according to the Canadian data sheet uh, in 2001. It was only 122 billion in 2016, 15 years later. Now, it's true that the green box payments notified increased three times during that period. But nonetheless, the trade distorting support hardly increased at all. And I just find that 
a remarkable achievement, if you like, of the of the uh, of, of the agreement. Of course, the balance of who was providing that trade distorting support has tr tr changed quite dramatically. So back in 2001, more than half, 54%, actually was the European Union, showing just how trade distorting its common agricultural policy was at the time. But as Stefan highlighted, there have been reforms there, and we can discuss whether they have been sufficient and adequate. We've just gone through a further discussion in, the, in Europe uh, 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 around our agricultural policy. Uh, so it's clear that the share of the European Union in the uh, uh, trade distorting uh, support has fallen. Uh, the share taken up by China and India in particular has, has increased. Of course, if we only look as far as 2016, we're not taking into account uh, the, the huge increase increase in, in, in US uh, payments to farmers uh, in the last two years. But uh, the point I want to make is that uh, th th there has been success, but th th the political landscape and the policy landscape has, has clearly changed. We see that also in trade flows where uh, um, the so-called Global South uh, developing countries now account for 40% for of global exports and imports. In fact, if you exclude intra-EU trade, uh, the figure is as high as 60%. So, you know, who has an interest in ensuring that there are robust trade rules uh, that can be enforced, uh, you know, is, 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 is now includes a very different set of countries. Um, and, and then there's this question of the new agenda, if you like, the climate, uh, the, the, the resource issues and so on. Does that create space where we could actually envisage a political agreement coming about? On the second issue, the you know is the package balanced? Um, uh, what I find uh, important in the package is that it does try to take uh, account of these grievances uh, that people feel, particularly on the domestic support area, uh, that that the, the, the package was unfair, that it simply discriminated uh, in favor of those who already were providing high levels of support and uh, 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 those countries that were, 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 were not providing support at the time uh, are unfairly penalized. And here, I think the suggestion, if we do stick with the sort of architecture of domestic support, and we do have this price gap approach, uh, I do think this updating of the, the fixed external reference price is a really important uh, step because it would at least bring better into harmony the, the, the measure of support under WTO rules and what we as economists tend to see as trade distorting support. So at the moment, you have what is frankly an unacceptable condition where WTO rules show that a country like India is providing significant support to its, uh, its producers. But if you look at the OECD, uh, producer support estimate, which is an economic measure of support, India has provided a, a negative support to all of its crop production in every year that the OECD has, 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 has the numbers for going back to 2000. Uh, so there's clearly, uh, you know, you can understand why India might feel aggrieved when other countries complain that it is unfairly supporting its, its, its farmers, when in fact, OECD figures show that that is not the case. So there's a clear need for, for, for reform. And on the sequencing, I suppose the big question is, do participants feel that progress can be made in the agricultural area alone? Um, which in a sense was, was the, the, the basis for the Pathways paper? Um, or does it have to be folded into a broader set of negotiations so that trade-offs can be made uh, you know, between agriculture and industry and, and services, digi digital trade and, and so on? So let, let me stop at that point, Clemens. Hopefully I've given a couple of questions that participants would, be, would like to respond to. Thank you. Clems, you are muted again. Yeah. Clems, you are muted again. And now? Yeah, yeah, good. Now okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. And as as you indicated in the beginning, there has been indeed there's been a lot of box shifting from, from amber to green. And that does raise questions as to how le less trade distorting the green box actually is. And I think that requires looking at as well. But before we go in any of those directions, one thing that, over, that overhangs all of this is really the political feasibility of all of this. 
And I've sent a brief message to both Alejandro Hara and to Alan Wolf, former deputy directors general who have a very good sense of the politics of the situation, whether they might want to address the political feasibility issue. And then Edwini, just to give you, if I may, could you give us towards the end, as we come to it, a brief overview of where we stand in the negotiations at the moment? With that said, let me hand it over first to Alejandro and then I'm going to ask Alan. Alejandro, are you there? Alejandro? Yes, I uh, thank you. Clem, I yield the floor to Alan because his, ex <laughs> his experience now is, much, is, is more recent uh, than mine. But mind you, uh, looking back at what happened in 2008, uh, I, I think the negotiations got stuck uh, not necessarily on agriculture, though it was a main component, but got stuck on how much NAMA you needed to compensate for the concessions in agriculture, okay? Uh, of course, if you don't want to make agriculture reform, uh, then you just keep asking for more in NAMA just to make the other impossible for the other side to move. So there is there an element of uh, balance, and this has a lot to do with the domestic politics uh, in the United States, uh, uh, in, in Europe and, and Japan, uh, et cetera. And interestingly now, uh, the, uh, of course, the, the landscape uh, ha has changed as maybe subsidization takes place in, in other jurisdictions uh, differently from the traditional subsidizing countries. Thanks. Clem, Clem, just to add what uh, Alejandro yeah, thank just you. said. Yeah, Alejandro, yes, the day before yesterday, he was teaching my students. Uh, he did put on uh, agriculture negotiations as one of the top issues to be resolved for future WTO reform. So I think that's also a good element. Yeah, but as I said right at the beginning, we nearly got there in December 2009, but it was how much NAMA was going to be able to contribute that stopped it in part. And Alejandro is perfectly right in what he said. Alan, may I give it to you, please? Yeah, a couple of observations. I'm not sure uh, Alejandro should have deferred to me at all. Uh, but uh, the um, in terms of one question I have is how important is the United States to a successful agricultural negotiation? Uh, the United States I, uh, sat on its hands in the last three and a half years, largely. I think it did some technical work. It participated in meetings in that sense. But uh, I didn't sense any um, great and useful initiatives. Edwini can correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, uh, and I, going forward, given the fact that a question is, what's the package to move agriculture forward? Uh, Switzerland would say NAMA. Uh, others would say other, other uh, maybe Japan would as well. Uh, the United States is not going to go for trade liberalization in the next um, two years before the midterm elections, I don't think, in any way, shape, or manner. Um, but could it uh, uh, come forward a bit on uh, limiting domestic support? It could, but I, it's not a strong priority right now. Uh, of course, the US is not organized. There is no agricultural chief negotiator at the trade office, and there's no uh, undersecretary yet uh, relevant at the uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, uh, questions, I, uh, and I, I've not sensed uh, in the last four years uh, much ambition on any part, anyone's part. Uh, I mean, Cairns would move forward clearly, but there's, uh, there's no following to that. Um, uh, so, yeah, but I do have a question uh, for the authors. Uh, and that is, has any official of any government in, a, in an ag ministry or any of the ambassadors in Geneva come forward and say, yeah, this, we can do this. Uh, we can go for it. My experience in um, talking with some of the recalcitrants uh, is they need a larger field uh, to operate on. Their instructions are terrible from capital. And uh, uh, they have to be able to go back and say, 
we have we really see some major trade-offs here that would be very beneficial to us. You know, is that PSH for India? Maybe. Um, are others willing to give it? Maybe, if there's something else is on the table. Um, I also have a question of the role for the secretariat, the, for the director general. Uh, Arthur Dunkel stuck, stuck his neck out in general to get the Uruguay round to a conclusion. Uh, and it was, of course, uh, then he was dismissed as a result. Um, but uh, uh, Ngozi is a pretty tough character. She would like to see, uh, she said food security is on the list and Edwini can probably uh, expand on what she said uh, for MC12. Uh, what could she do? Uh, she seems to be a risk taker. Uh, so that, those are some observations, but um, as of now, I've not seen um, any ambition, never mind a high enough level of ambition. Um, that's that's it from from Washington for the moment. Thank thank you very much, Alan. Uh, the floor is actually open. I don't have any questions being posed by anybody. Anybody want to risk one? Come on, guys. This is an interesting paper. Let let me ask you then, Carmel and Stefan, were we to go to a single definition of OTDS? persuade countries that they bind that level of OTDS and then measure their, uh, their, their compliance by it simply on the basis of budgetary expenditure, which is much like in option three. Would that work? Can I dare to uh, attempt a response? Uh, I think it would indeed, uh, and as I uh, said earlier, in a way, this, this is the Nirvana, uh, and uh, you appear to uh, favor the Nirvana approach, so to speak. Uh, it much depends really on, uh, does I do, it's, it's very simple, Stefan, I'm sorry to break in, but I'm looking for something that is simple and is easy to notify and can be verified. Yeah, uh, they, I personally, as an economist, uh, would strongly uh, argue that uh, in the absence uh, of uh, enough border protection, you anyhow cannot provide domestic support, uh, domestic uh, market price support. And therefore, it's in a way double counting. If you have limits on the border protection uh, through tariff bindings and reductions, uh, you don't really uh, have an absolute need for also constraining market price support. Uh, and on top of that, you have all these difficulties of uh, measuring it uh, properly uh, that uh, we have seen uh, in uh, countries' uh, attempts at uh, coming to grips with that after the Uruguay round. So uh, I would indeed uh, much subscribe to the uh, argument uh, that uh, this double counting should be done away with. Uh, let's uh, limit uh, price support uh, through appropriate reductions in tariffs uh, and then uh, concentrate uh, on the rest of domestic support and the rest of it is budgetary support. Uh, so I think based on that economic argument, uh, I would fully favor an approach uh, that uh, goes just to budgetary support. Uh, a, uh, an approach, by the way, and Carmel uh, has alluded to that already earlier, uh, that probably uh, could also benefit other sectors, uh, and the uh, ASCM uh, could uh, potentially be uh, revised uh, on the basis of that type of consideration uh, and uh, just go to budgetary uh, expenditure and have limits on that uh, rather than going uh, at the length of uh, determining injury and all the rest of it. Thank, thank you, Steph. And the latter is a more systemic question, but a more systemic question as to how we deal with the subsidies agreement. And Carmel, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, let me, I, I agree, of course, with what um, Stefan uh, said specifically on, on that issue. I think our preference would 
distinctly be to go in that direction if you could get enough action on, on market access to make sure that it was foolproof. Because if you have very high uh, tariffs, um, then in fact con countries can probably do a lot that doesn't show up in budget uh, if they have that, that, that protection. But maybe I should clarify something because Clem, you expressed a, um, a, a worry uh, at the beginning that it would be impossible to persuade the developing countries to uh, give up on, on Article 6.2. First of At all, least very think, difficult. Yeah, I, I, I know it politically it's incredibly difficult, but there's actually um, one, there's one country which is the absolute major user of, of uh, 6.2 and we know who that is. Um, so it doesn't actually affect an awful lot of countries. But uh, the other thing is we, you know, when we talk about a kind of a, not so much a de minimis, but a de, de maximus level of distorting domestic support that would be expressed as the value of production. We never pronounced on where we thought that level should be. But of course, countries can choose to shelter within that um, input subsidies. I mean, whatever they, they want to do, we would hope they wouldn't. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're not talking about going to, to, to zero, I think a long way from that. If you consider that right now, as of today, um, developing countries have 10% product specific de minimis, 10% non product specific de minimis expressed as in, in terms of value of production. So it gets updated with inflation. That's 20% of the value of production, plus the 6.2 uh, exemptions, plus the whole of the green box. There, I mean, there's absolute huge scope there for countries to do essentially anything that they would want. So realistically, any, any, any discipline expressed in terms of the benchmark level of distorting support as a percentage of the value of production, um, uh, which would somehow bring all of that together, would, would still be allowing countries scope to do things which we know are extremely bad, bad for the climate, bad for the soils, bad for their budgets, bad for, bad for, for, for everything. But it's, it's, uh, there would still be scope to, to do those things for countries that want to do them. I, I agree with you. We're going, to, we're going to run out of time quite soon. And I, I would like to hand over, before we do that, I'd like to hand the floor to, to Kessie to see, to update us perhaps briefly on the status of the negotiations. And as you do, Sir Kessie, could you sort of give some thought also to my own particular favorite, as it were, namely an exemption on humanitarian aid, which is something that's Comes, that's been before the council now twice, has been rejected twice. And I, I, I do hope that we can do at least something that export restrictions on humanitarian aid. But Kessie, that's just a wish that you would, just, that that could be done and perhaps that you could address it. But more generally, please talk to the overall state, <coughs> state of the negotiation, <coughs> state of the negotiations at the moment. Thanks, Edwini. Okay, um, thanks, Clem. Um, um, for sure, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to start, but um, I do think that uh, we are at a crossroads in terms of where we are in the negotiations. The chair of the Ag negotiations, Ambassador Gloria um, Abraham Peralta of Costa Rica, has informed members that she would like to move into text based negotiations. So. Um, I think she's looking um, at the possibility of having draft text, which will be circulated to members by the end of July. And then when members come back, then they will move into that phase of negotiations. Um, but in terms of where we are, I think um, there are no illusions on the part of members. I think um, the negotiations are quite difficult. Uh, members, obviously the priority for members is domestic support. However, there are different approaches which are being advocated by members. On the one hand, on the one end of the spectrum, you have China, India, and they basically are insistent that the starting point should be elimination of support beyond, D uh, beyond a AMS, beyond D minimis. So it's very difficult. The developed countries or um, the developed country members find it dif difficult to accept that. Now, China and India have a lot of support among the ACP countries because they think 
uh, we need to address the historical imbalances of the AOA before we address um, other issues. But I think the chair and the DG have made it clear that it would be good if we move concurrently. But if you really want to say, well, look, uh, we need to address um, support beyond the minimum, it will be very difficult for that to get traction among the developed country parts. So in as much as all members are committed to addressing trade distorting support, we have different approaches. Now, what is the most realistic outcome on domestic support at MC12? On the one hand, you have the Keynes Group. They are quite ambitious. They would like to have what they call a framework agreement. Um, others think that a framework agreement is not feasible, but we should rather aim for a work program or a roadmap. And you know, there are quite differences. I think what they mean by a framework agreement is that it would have much more details, specificity. And this is what the United States and European Union don't like because they think that we shouldn't prejudge the outcome of the negotiations. So they do not share the view of the Keynes group that we need a framework agreement um, at MC12. So realistically, I think if we are quite lucky, we may be able to get a work program, but even the elements may be very difficult to negotiate. So um, I think as far as domestic support, this is what we are looking at in terms of having a work program. And I think um, the, um, the chair, the COAS chair would reflect that in her text. Um, as I said, she intends to circulate that by the ending of July. And she may have options for members as far as domestic support is concerned. But clearly, I think a lot of countries or a lot of members are not so keen on the framework agree agreement, especially with the United States and the European Union very much opposed to a framework agreement. I think the most realistic option may be a work program. But even that one, I think um, we still have a lot of work to do in order to define the elements. On, um, in terms of, um, Clem, your question as to whether the WFP, I think we were close last December. There were only two members, India and Tanzania, um, which kind of held out. Um, so I think we can be reasonably optimistic that we may be able to get it um, for MC12. I know the DG has been talking to the Tanzanians and also with India, but I think a lot of countries have also stressed that they wouldn't like to harvest um, the BFP exemption alone. They would like to see it as part of a broader package. So it is. it remains to be seen, but I think it's just one of the things which could be a possible deliverable at MC12. The United States and the EU are very keen or what they think is that because of the gaps in members positions and we have maybe barely three, four months, what they think is possible is a transparency centered package or outcome. But Keynes, the ACP group and number of members believe that is not adequate. We cannot basically at MC12 have something centered only on transparency. So that seems to be um, I don't think it, it would have a lot of traction. I think countries would like something more. So um, the idea of having something on transparency alone, I do not think that would be supported by a lot of the members. Although we have two major powers, the EU and the US saying that um, given the, um, the wide divergences in members' views, they believe that is what is possible. And um, I think for a number of um, members, they, too, they do not think that is possible. So, on public stock holdings, a very difficult issue. Um, a lot of members, particularly the European Union and the United States position is that the permanent solution can be found in the agreement on agriculture. So we do not know whether the US would be willing to consider a permanent solution, but the European Union, Brazil and others believe that it has to be dealt with alongside domestic support. So whereas the proponents reject any linkage between domestic support and um, public stock holding. So it is quite um, very difficult at this stage to predict whether we should be. I mean, in Buenos Aires, we were quite close because we had a decision. The main elements would be the Bali interim um, decision or the Bali decision, and then we extend it to new programs, but very limited. So we think that um, the Elements for a permanent solution are quite clear. Once we resolve the issue as to um, 
the scope and then we have stronger safeguards merely that there shouldn't be any export from procured stocks and we, we need to have um, you know um, not stringent transparency requirements but to have robust transparency requirements but here again developing countries also have pointed out that they do not want onerous or burdensome obligations which would frustrate the use of the permanent solution but i think we do have the elements to have a permanent solution to dsh but it becomes a political issue a political issue in the sense that um, even if we manage to get compromises on safeguards on transparency and the scope um, politically i think it may be difficult to for some members to accept a standalone decision on public stock holding if there is no parallel movement on domestic support. So um, it is at, at this stage not very clear that we will be able to get a decision on public stock holding. Um, setting on market access, we haven't done much on market access for various reasons. Um, I think as um, Alan pointed out, um, um, the US has an offensive interest in market access so that some Latin American countries, Paraguay and others, they would also like to see a framework agreement adopted at MC12, but we haven't done much. So going to MC12, what we are looking at is maybe having some transparency elements, be it um, you know, um, um, uh, applied tariffs, so changes in uh, uh, applied tariffs, once goods have set sale, would we be able to um, get something so that's what we are looking at, you know, goods on route, whether we'll be able to get something um, on tariff simplification, I think is very difficult and the G10 um, are opposed to it. So in terms of market access, I, I do not see anything substantive. Uh, we will be lucky to get a work program um, to commence work post MC12 on market access. On SSM, I think um, it is quite clear, a number of countries believe that we can only talk about SSM only when we have new market access con um, concessions. So without that, it will be very difficult for us to make progress on SSM. So uh, we cannot, I think at MC12, the best um, scenario would be to continue the work um, in, in dedicated sessions on SSM and try to move forward the process. But I do not think that we would be able at this stage to have um, a fully fledged outcome on, um, on SSM. Now on export restrictions, I've already mentioned um, uh, one thing apart from the WFP would be to, um, if members could agree to advance notice. In Buenos Aires, we basically had a decision, a draft decision, which would have, um, you know, the terms were quite clear that members to the, to the extent possible, members should give 30 days notice before they impose export restrictions. Um, I think we're going to run with that, um, 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 especially with the COVID. I think we should be able to get that because the language is not very prescriptive. Um, it basically say where possible, countries should give 30 days notice before they impose export restrictions. So I think we should be able to get that. At, um, um, but we never know. I mean, there are some countries like South Africa who are stridently opposed to that. But I think given the nature of the language, if we were to choose the words carefully, so as to not to make it appear that it is an obligation, then I think we should be able to do that together with the WFP as far as export restrictions are concerned. On export competition, I think um, it, that we basically, um, the monitoring mechanism countries are focused on improving that. Um, but it's not a priority for most countries. I think a lot of countries or members are happy with the Nairobi decision, but there is a lot of work to be done also, let's say on food aid and others. But for now, it is not a priority for many members. On cotton, it will be very difficult. I think um, the position of the United States and others without substantive progress on domestic support generally, it will be very difficult for some for the United States to agree, um, agree on domestic support for cotton. So I think it will be difficult. What we are looking at is basically depending on what we have on domestic support generally, then that will be tailored for cotton, but it will be very difficult to have um, something more ambitious on cotton when there is no clarity on what we may be able to get on domestic support generally. So I think I've covered the seven areas, but um, the most, I think we are all waiting for the chest text, as I said, by the ending of July, and um, the idea would be 
that countries would then go away for the summer break and work would begin in earnest on the chess text in September. And then I think by that time, there should be clarity as to what may be attainable at MC12. So I think I'll just stop here for now. Thank you very much, Clem. Ed, Ed Weenie, thank you very much indeed. That, that was really good to, it was good to get that summary. And I'm delighted by what you said about WFP through the uh, through treatments. Uh, I, Al, I'm told Alan has a question and so does Lou. I'm just not sure which Alan it is that has a question. Lou? I Alan? think, uh, yeah, Alan Wolf. Uh, Alan, uh, it's Alan Wolf. Yeah, it's Alan Wolf. Sorry. Alan, the question, the floor is yours. Yeah, very briefly. First of all, uh, great pro, uh, great paper. I assume it's public, it's on the web. Uh, I will highlight it at a talk to the U.S. Grains Council later this month if there's no objection. Uh, one observation, question of fiscal pressure. Uh, with respect to domestic support, COVID-19 has put a lot of pressure on a lot of governments, and my hope is that that will... Um, make them a little more interested in uh, an international agreement that uh, addresses domestic support. They have more political flexibility to enter into such an agreement. Uh, on the World Food Program, uh, I would like to see the countries that have signed the declaration, I think there are 59 of them or so, uh, simply say, it's part of the WTO. Those who are, haven't signed on aren't bound but uh, take on South Africa and India on the, what their attack on the joint statement initiatives and say, no, no, you don't understand. Uh, that's gonna be a WTO agreement. It'll be administered by the WTO. It's now a binding uh, agreement on the part of all signatories. Uh, that changes the nature of the WTO to some degree, but it needs that change if e-commerce and domestic services and the other JSIs are to move forward. So. I'd like to see the, the WFP uh, really become formalized. Um, uh, that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. I, I hope that uh, this paper gains traction uh, because it's, uh, it points some very useful ways forward. Alan, thank you. Uh, Lou, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I have two quick questions uh, on the on the paper. Uh, of course, uh, this is a great paper, as many others have said. Uh, one question, which is uh, uh, related to climate change as uh, 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 and agriculture policy, uh, I saw that it was emphasized in the in the paper, but in the presentation, I don't see much mentioned there except on the green box. Uh, there was something said about option one. Some will be eased. I assume that will help to accommodate um, uh, climate changes subsidies in future, or option two, uh, when environmental uh, uh, subsidies are, are going to be, uh, is mentioned also. So I uh, maybe some more uh, more thoughts on that would be very much welcome. The second thing is about that uh, in your presentation, I don't see anywhere the special and differential treatment is mentioned. I know this is uh, uh, a cross-cutting issue that is uh, right now discussed at a higher level. But I just wonder whether you and other authors of this paper have given any thought on that. Uh, I mean, in terms of agriculture negotiations, any, any, if not, just okay. I just wonder whether that was also discussed among yourselves. Thanks. Carmel, Stefan. Carmel, go ahead. Okay, I'll start and maybe Stefan can, can complete. So first of all, I wanted to say to, um, to uh, Edwini, because uh, I was really interested in everything that he said, that um, without wanting to sound boastful, I think our proposal addresses every single one of the issues, um, but only if taken as a package. So I find it very worrisome that individual small elements of it could be picked off because the more elements that you pick off um, the less chances you ever have of having a package that together will will solve everything um, but um, that was what we what we what we set out to do so you're not 
would not be surprised that I'm claiming that that's what we, that that, what, that's what we managed to do. Um, on climate change, uh, I, it's, it's maybe not as prominent as it should be, but it was intended to be. We believe, first of all, that rowing back all of those most distorting um, measures uh, is probably the most important thing you can do for, for climate change, because all of that trade distorting domestic support, um, those um, exempted input subsidies, all of those things are uh, inciting uh, fossil fuel use, intensification, et cetera, et cetera. So first, the first step is to roll back. And we think that's you know, one of the most important things. Then we didn't go into the details, but we do recommend within the, um, the different options for the green box, um, either in option one, a specific recognition of climate change measures, um, or in, in option two, uh, if uh, climate change measures meet certain criteria that in fact, they would not even need to be notified in terms of expenditures or, or, or so on. So I think there's, there's quite a lot of acknowledgement of, of um, climate um, and, and it really was very big in our minds in, in, in drawing up the paper. On special and differential treatment, we know it's extremely difficult. Uh, we, we never actually discussed a specific proposal, but I think I can say, at least speaking for myself, um, that other than we, we said some specific things about exempting the least developed countries in, in certain areas, but it, it seems clear to me, at least it's a personal view that we need, um, we need a system of classifying um, countries uh, by level of development that's evidence-based, that's somehow objective. Um, but we didn't go uh, any further uh, in, in terms of, of wanting to propose something there. But uh, we, we do think it's got to be uh, evidence-based. Um, and then finally, if I may, uh, uh, Clem, on the, the political economy sort of questions. Well, I, I could try and speak from high up, you know, 10,000 meters above in the clouds about multilateralism and all the rest of it. But on the, the issue that Alan uh, began to touch on, which is could there be pressure coming from below from the agriculture sector? Um, I think what we're seeing is pressures that are emerging from the immense damage that the policies are doing, again, in terms of climate, in terms of soil, um, and you know, ultimately in terms of, of, of food security. So um, there may be fiscal pressure too, but we've seen, for example, China is beginning to, to turn its policies around. Um, and why is China turning the policies around? Well, partly because they had a huge problem with accumulated stocks and huge costs, but also because huge damage was being done in terms of, of soil. A huge damage was being done in terms of depleting the water table and, and so on. And, and so they are trying to change. My, my worry, my fear uh, is that in other parts of the world where you have the same pressures, uh, if the policies aren't turned around, that the factor that will cause the policies to change and maybe open the way up to negotiations ultimately will actually be so catastrophic that nobody would ever, ever wish that such a thing could happen. And I think it's a real, real worry. And I'm talking particularly about water uh, issues in some very important agriculture producing regions of the world. So I'll, I'll stop there. Carmel, thank you very much indeed. Stefan, anything to add before we close shop? <laughs> No, I think Carmel has done a very good job in responding to the question. Perhaps uh, one or two words about uh, special and differential treatment. Uh, I fully subscribe to what Carmel has said uh, and would just only add, uh, we wouldn't see much uh, grounds for uh, having a special and differential treatment provision, uh, particularly for agriculture. Developing countries may need uh, more time uh, to engage in reductions, that's fine uh, overall, but uh, anything specific to agriculture would uh, generally tend uh, to lead in a direction where in the end, uh, the countries concerned uh, shoot themselves into their own feet. Uh, and uh, it's not like the WTO should help them doing that. Uh, so let's have a general definition, evidence-based of special and deferential treatment. And where in agriculture, it's a matter of speed uh, that uh, the developing countries have a, a little more uh, time to uh, engage in the adjustments, uh, but uh, otherwise it doesn't make much sense to have anything specific in agriculture uh, on that particular uh, dimension. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. 
we're out of time. I think it's time to wrap up. Carmel, Stefan, Alan, thank you very much for your paper and your explanations of it. But also, Edwini, thank you very much for your for your uh, for your words on the state of play. It's very much appreciated. And thank you all very much for attending. And I'm signing off, giving the floor over briefly to Lou for a final word. Thanks a lot. And also thanks go to you, Clems, for, for your nice uh, moderation. And of course, the same goes to the other speakers, really. And of course, to all our participants for being with us. Uh, this is really, as many have said, that important issue and very complicated and politically sensitive so that one hour and a half would never serve the purpose. So we need more time. But that's why also we, we would welcome any further researchers from the pathway, uh, Stephen Kamel or others that may be helpful uh, to, to do another or, or more brainstormings like this to, uh, to, to push the, the, the thoughts uh, uh, forward and hopefully to help our members that move uh, uh, forward on their negotiations uh, uh, up to or even beyond M12. And uh, one last word is that, uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, our group is very much trying to open now. So any new ideas, new research papers uh, uh, related to WTO reform, you're most welcome to bring them to our attention. We'll be most happy to discuss how we can host some other uh, events like this uh, to, to collectively support the WTO and the multilateral trading system. So with that, thanks to you all and wish you a, a nice rest of the day and we'll see each other next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thanks a lot.